The House will come to order. Today, the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Representative McLaughlin as well. It's the Representative McLaughlin in the House Day. It's my day, and don't take it away from me. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Schiebel, please take the roll. Okay. Representatives Amabile, Armagost, Bacon, Assistant Majority Leader Bacon, excused, Bird, Bockenfeld, Rep. Bockenfeld. Excused. Basenecker. Bottoms. Bradfield. Bradley. Brown. Catlin. Clifford. Representative Clifford. Excused. Doherty. DeGraff. Degree Kennedy. Rep. Degree Kennedy. Excused. Duran. English. Excused. Epps. Evans. Frizzell. Froelich. Garcia. Hamrick. Herod. Or, excuse me, Hartsuk. <laughs> Rep. Hartsuk. Excused. Hernandez. Herod is excused. Holtorf. Judah. Right. Representative Judah. Excused. Joseph. Kip. Leader. Lindsay. Representative Lindsay. Excused. Linstead. Here. Luck. Here. Lukens. Lynch. Mabry. Marshall. Martinez. Marvin. Morrow. McCormick. McLaughlin. Ortiz. Rep Ortiz is excused. Parenti, Puglisi, Ricks, Representative Ricks, 
Rex is excused. Root now. Sirota. Representative Sirota. Sirota is excused. Snyder. Soper. Story. Taggart. Titone. Valdez A. Here. Velasco. Representative Velasco. Excused. V Hill. Weinberg. Weissman. Representative Weissman. Excused. Wilford. Excused. Re Wilson. Winter. Woodrow. Young. And Madam Speaker. Here. With 52 present and 13 excused, we do have a quorum. Representative McLaughlin, third time's a charm. I've missed you. <laughs> I've missed so, you too. Okay, here's another fun fact. If you are a hot springs lover, Pagosa Springs is known for its hot springs with three resorts nearby and one right on Main Street downtown. It is fabulous. The area is extraordinarily beautiful and I hope you can come visit for a very relaxing weekend. Um, Madam Speaker, I move that the Journal of Tuesday, April 9th, be approved as it corrected by the Chief Clerk. Thank you. Members, you have heard the motion that the journal be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. Wow, that was anemic. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, reports of committees of reference. Committee on Appropriations. After consideration of the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bills 1105 as amended, 1124, 1220, 1276 as amended, 1294 as amended, and 1351, and Senate Bills 19, 26, and 161 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Schiebel. Okay, announcements and introductions. Uh, who do I pick first? Okay, Rep Froelich, then Rep McLaughlin, then Thank Rep you, Madam Amabili. Speaker. The Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Committee will meet in the building, room change, 107 or 108, something like that. Uh, I'll confirm by text with you for four bills, um, 1383, uh, Senate Bill 100, action only on 1239 and 1242. Representative McLaughlin. I guess I'm not done. Um, Education Committee, look on the calendar. That is the bill that we have today. And um, we have a guest to um, introduce today, uh, Representative Catlin and I. Representative Catlin, or members, your attention, please. Members, it is my pleasure to recognize and introduce to you this morning a doctor and constituent of House District 59, Dr. April Randall, an internal medicine specialist from Cortez. Today, COPIC and the Colorado Medical Society are recognizing Dr. Randall as the 2023 COPIC Humanitarian Award recipient. This award is presented annually to honor a physician for volunteer medical services and contributions to their committee. The award aims to recognize those individuals who unassumingly volunteer outside of their spectrum of the day-to-day -day lives. The recipient of the award designates a $10,000 donation from COPIC, and as this year's award winner, Dr. Randall has chosen to direct her donation to support Basin Clinic in Natarita, Colorado, which is an HD 58, represented by my good friend, Representative Catlin. Founded in 1979, the nonprofit Basin Clinic serves the Nucla, Natarita, Bedrock, Redvale, Van Coram, Paradox, Gateway, Norwood, and Slick Rock communities. That's a lot in southwestern Colorado. 
located 100 miles from the nearest hospital in the next major city. Basic Clinic exists to serve the wide-ranging needs of many Southwest Coloradans. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. Yeah, both of you. Thank you. No. Members, Dr. Randall is recognized for her commitment to making Members, it. your attention, please. Thank you. Representative Catlin. Thank you. Dr. Randall is recognized for her commitment to making a difference in health care. She has spent the last 15 years providing care in rural Colorado, and her dedication and tireless efforts have made a lasting impact on the lives of those living in rural areas of Dove Creek, Cortez, and Natarita. After a successful and rewarding career, Dr. Randall most recently came out of retirement to become medical director of the Basin Clinic in Natarita, Colorado. She has graciously given of her time to travel from her home in Cortez over an hour and a half away to the clinic to meet with patients and agencies. Dr. Randall is a compassionate, dedicated, and selfless individual who is always willing to help. It is our pleasure to present the annual COPIC Humanitarian Award to Dr. April Randall and the Basin Clinic Please join me in congratulating her for this award. Congratulations. Thank you for your dedication. Thank it you, shows members. in my communities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Representative Joseph. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I just wanted to make an announcement. Excel will be here from 1 to 4 downstairs in the basement and commi committee room 109 to discuss the power outage over the weekend for the seven affected counties, Boulder, Broomfield, and Douglas counties, Jefferson, Gilpin, Larimer, and West Denver Metro. So if you have any feedback, any conversations you'd like to have, please, please, please come downstairs to represent our communities. Thank you so much. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to recognize a group that is here visiting today, the Family Leadership Training Institute. Um, we have several folks, um, students from this institute here today. It's a civic program provided through partnership with the Colorado State University. These youth leaders spend more than 15 hours over eight weeks to develop skills needed to become effective leaders in their communities while further understanding our democracy. The evidence-based curriculum integrates leadership preparation and civic participation skills and inspires and trains um, these individuals to become effective leaders and change agents in their communities. We have many of these students here today from Longmont, Lafayette, and Boulder, and I want them to stand up so that we can recognize them. Um, many of them are here at the Capitol for the very first time ever. Welcome. Delighted to have you all. Representative Tatone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, tomorrow morning, Joint Technology is really going to meet this time at 8.30 and room 352. We're going to talk about a bill from the Facial Recognition Task Force. In fact, the Facial Recognition Task Force is going to meet today uh, in the same room at 3.30. So if you want to join in and listen in on that, that's another opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Assistant Majority Leader Bacon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to make an announcement that Judiciary Committee will be meeting today in the Old State Library. We will be hearing Bills 1432, Senate Bill 3, House Bill 1433, and House Bill 1380. We'll be meeting at 1.30 in the Old State Library. Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Speaker. House Finance will be meeting across the street in LSBA upon adjournment to hear two bills for action only, 271, 286, and three other bills, 1326, 044, Senate Bill 044, and Senate Bill 16. Thank you. 
Representative Kip. Um, thank you, Energy Environment members. I just want to make sure you know we are not meeting this morning, but tomorrow we will be meeting in the afternoon, not in LSBA. We will be meeting in the Old State Library tomorrow. So we have uh, three bills up, but I'll announce those tomorrow. Representative Amabile. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Business Affairs and Labor will be meeting today upon adjournment uh, in room 112. And we're hearing two bills, 1356 and 1378. And we'll, we'll meet 10 minutes after adjournment. Thanks. All right. Madam Majority Leader. Oh, I have some announcements. <laughs> Silly me. OK, Representative Basenecker will replace Representative English on the Business Affairs and Labor Committee for today only. Representative Lindsay will replace Representative Lindstedt on the Finance Committee for today only. Representative Kipp will replace Representative Herod on the Judiciary Committee for today only. Representative Clifford will replace Representative Weissman on the Judiciary Committee for today only. Representative Lukens will replace Representative English on the Health and Human Services Committee for today only. And Representative Marvin will replace Representative Judah on the Transportation and Local Government Committee for today only. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the following bills be made special orders on Wednesday, April 10th, 2024 at 9.22 a.m. Senate Bill 172, Senate Bill 177, House Bill 1276, House Bill 1124, House Bill 1220, Senate Bill 26, Senate Bill 161, House Bill 1253, House Bill 1105. Seeing no objection, the bills listed by the Majority Leader will be made special orders on Wednesday, April 10th, 2024 at 9.22 a.m. Representative Mabry. Members, you've heard the motion. Seeing no objection, Representative Mabry will take the chair.
a lot up here today. I'm not sure if this is... <laughs> the committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there is a request for reading a bill at length. Committee reports are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and on your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon motion of the majority leader and the coat rule is relaxed. Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of Senate Bill 172? Senate Bill 172 by Senator Pelton B. Also Representative McLaughlin concerning changing the phrase industrial hemp product to the phrase hemp product in the statutes that regulate marijuana. To the bill. Representative McLaughlin. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Senate Bill uh, 172, the Committee of the Whole, please, on second reading. Thanks. Okay. To the bill. Representative McLaughlin. Yes, this bill comes from the Statutory Revision Committee, and it, it changes the term of industrial hemp, hemp product to the currently defined hemp product all across um, all the marijuana statutes. This just is clarifying um, typos. It's kind of what's being done anyway, but they just found a few spots where um, it's not consistent. So that's what this does is mark up consistency. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on Senate Bill 172? Seeing none, the motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 172. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The bill is adopted. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 177. Senate Bill 177 by Senators Mullica and Simpson, also Representatives Catlin and Story, concerning the authority of History Colorado to dispose of its North Storage facility. Okay. Okay, to the bill. Representative Story. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, colleagues. We are, um, um, I'd like to move Senate Bill 24 177. Okay, to the bill. Representative Story. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this bill comes out of the Capital Development Committee. And um, this is concerning History Colorado. History Colorado has a um, significantly sized storage facility um, on the north end of town where they house an enormous amount of artifacts um, from Colorado's history. Um, they have very small, tiny um, artifacts as well as very huge artifacts including um, a portion of a sod house, and they have carriages and other large um, pieces of equipment from Colorado's history. The problem with this facility is that it is not aptly sized for the amount of material that they um, collect over time. Um, it's about 50% too small. In addition, the, um, the facility itself is in horrible state of repair. Um, they, they have a lack of ability to maintain environmental conditions within the building, which are, was just really important. And uh, the roof leaks. They have a lot of equipment and trash cans scattered around the building trying to collect water so it doesn't damage the artifacts. The roof is not stable. The lighting is horrible and inefficient. They can't even get some equipment to repair or um, replace HVAC, lighting, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but it's not practical to address this building. So what this bill does is provide an opportunity for them to sell the building and take that revenue along with some other revenue to um, latch onto a, another state building and move their artifacts um, in short order as soon as this other building is ready. So we urge an I vote on this bill. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you as well. 
Thank you, sir. Members, History Colorado is the steward of the state's 15 million item collection that spans 13,000 years. One of their storage facilities that we're talking about, known as the North Storage, is a 50,000 square foot building that holds about 85,000 square feet of artifacts. Representative Catlin, hang on one second. Members, uh, you, it is a little loud in here. If you could please keep it down. Okay, please continue, Representative Catlin. As I said, it's a building that the roof leaks, the lighting system sparks, and, on, and non functioning HVAC, and a lot more other problems. This bill will allow History Colorado to sell that facility when the time is right and the market's correct, and use the proceeds, proceeds to, retain, to retain them for controlled maintenance, moving, and retrofitting costs on a building that they've secured on Pierce Street. This Pierce Street will be more adequate for their storage needs. This is one of those bills that's good governance. It allows us to do some good things and it allows you and I to help secure the past of the state of Colorado. This is a good bill. Vote yes. Is there any further discussion? Representative Taggart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you as well. The peanut gallery over here asked me not to embarrass our caucus, and I'll try not to embarrass the caucus. This is, um, this is a really good bill. We have a lot of artifacts, I think 85,000 if I remember the number correctly, that are sitting in this North Storage facility that are critical to the history of Colorado, and we need to protect them. They need History Colorado needs to sell this building and move into a building that can, in fact, protect those artifacts that are critical to our history as a state. We spent a lot of time on this in the JBC, and I want you to be aware that it's one of about three or four proposed moves that are important, and I support all of them. One of them is the move of History Colorado and its artifacts potentially to the Pierce Street facility, which today houses part of the Department of Revenue. The Department of Revenue, um, because it, it, they have, in fact, are open to the public, are potentially moving to AHEC down here on campus and take a floor within CDOT's facility. And so this is the first potential domino of those moves. In all cases, it makes these departments more efficient and it brings about better facilities in particular for History Colorado that, it, that is in a facility that you've already heard um, that could potentially damage, create damage for very important artifacts of this state. So I ask for your support on this bill. It's a good bill. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, I'm going to help the good representative who I asked not to embarrass us, but let me tell you the statistics because this is very fascinating. 13,000 years of Colorado history that they store with 15 million things, not one representative bottoms, 15 million things. 50,000 square feet storing 85,000 feet of artifact. They don't have controlled heat or AC, and this is why they need to go to a different um, place. And I support this bill. They even said they had a covered wagon they have to store and a sod house. So we need to help History Colorado support them, get them into a facility that, a more modern facility, where we can control the heat and the AC and keep up with the valuable history of Colorado, which again hosts over 15 million different things representing our state. 
So I would urge an I vote on this bill. Thank you. Representative Winter. Assistant Minority Leader Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also rise in support of this. As I speak for House District 47 all the time, whether it's in committee or in the well, I always talk about our heritage and our way of life. And I think it's important that we preserve our heritage. Good heritage and bad heritage. I mean, the great heritage we always push forward, but the bad heritage we always take a look back on as a reminder and the things of the past on you know, how this state was founded, how it works, and we always try to move forward with that. And I think that this is very important. I mean, if we lose our history, we lose everything. And having our artifacts in a building like this doesn't do the citizens of Colorado justice. I think it's good that they're willing to sell this building to procure these artifacts in a, in a good climate controlled storage facility. I know in my area, we have a few museums. The back of Bloom House is one that's in my little community. It's like the only museum we have in the Fireman's Museum. But people in Trinidad, go to that museum over and over again. We have Bent's Old Fort in Otero County. Um, we have the Sand Creek Massacre site. There are places that people in different areas go to all the time to talk about the history of those different areas. And this is how we pass it on to the next generation about what happened in Colorado, how it's woven into the, factor, into the fabric of this great state and how it affects every citizen in the state. So I'm honored to stand up here and support this bill. I think it's a really good bill and anytime we can preserve history and heritage in the state of Colorado, I think this is something that no matter what side of the aisle you're on, I think we all agree that you know, making sure that we protect the heritage and history of this state is a good thing. So I urge an I vote, thank you. Is there any further discussion? Representative Weinberg. Fellow colleagues, the history preservation of this state is very important. I rise in support of this bill. This bill authorizes History Colorado to sell a storage facility in Denver. The sale is subject to approval by the Capital Development Committee and the State Controller. The proceeds of any sale accredited to the State Museum Cash Fund to be used for new storage facility or controlled maintenance expenditures. Stuff like this is very important to me. Being from the country of South Africa, preserving my heritage, having the Holocaust Museum, being a Jew. This is very important. I hope that we all take this seriously, and I hope that this bill will be a unanimous yes vote by everybody in the chamber. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Representative Holtorf. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no idea what my colleague from Loveland just said. But <clears throat> he is a good friend and colleague, and I respect him dearly. There's something that I want to talk about with History Colorado and all these things that preserve history, something that still weighs heavy on my heart. And I believe that this particular artifact is probably in storage, perhaps even in this facility. You see, right out here, on the west side of the state capitol used to stand a Union cavalryman. Many of you know that I'm a lifetime servant and defender of the Constitution, having served 29 years in the United States Army, 29 years, 9 months, and 16 days, for those of us counting. I have great respect for our history, particularly our military history. That Union cavalryman that stood outside that was torn down several years ago because of actions in this chamber has now been put in storage and now has to be moved somewhere else. Instead of proudly standing out here, my fellow colleagues, right outside this building, but more shamefully, my colleagues, is the fact that there is plywood covering the names of every Union soldier who fought to defend this union and fought to abolish slavery in this country. Those young men gave up their lives so African Americans could be free in this country. From this state, they volunteered from Colorado and went to battlefields back east, Chippewa, Antietam, Gettysburg, and many other battlefields so we could lift up those citizens of this union 
based on the leadership of Abraham Lincoln in the Emancipation Proclamation that came. Those young men gave up their lives and their names are covered by plywood. And that Union soldier, that cavalryman, that young, I believe, corporal, sergeant, I'm not sure, has been removed. As if that is some shameful thing that we cannot look at in this state. It is abhorrent. And now it is in storage and it's going to be taken away to another storage place. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the history we need to preserve. For you young people in here, listen up. This country is a great country. There are people that have given their lives, and I have fellow veterans in here that have friends, battle buddies, and colleagues who have served in combat zones all around the world, who made the ultimate sacrifice to defend the very liberties that are preserved in this chamber. For me to speak and represent my constituents in House District 63. You can tell, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not happy about the fact that these artifacts are all in storage, particularly this one artifact of this proud young man who swore an oath to the Constitution of the United States, like many other veterans in this chamber, and went off to foreign battlefields far away from his home state of Colorado albeit in the United States of America, Virginia, Mississippi, Tennessee, very far away Representative from their Holtorf, homes in Colorado. Representative Holtorf, I've given you a lot of leeway, and we appreciate the history lesson, but um, can you please uh, take it back to the bill? Thank you. I appreciate that very much. So I believe I feel better now. Thank you for your attention and time. I greatly appreciate the privilege to speak to this matter, and I do want to talk about how valuable History Colorado, actually, with respect to storing and preserving. I think those relics need to come out in future time, and we need to take care of them and preserve them so they can be displayed. And we can remember those valiant young men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice so we could be free in this great country and land. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your attention. God bless America, and thank you that all people could be free from every ethnicity in this country to speak their mind. Now I am going to stop because the hair on the back of my head is tingling because the chair is getting a little short with my liberties to speak. Thank you. Uh, members, before the next speaker comes up, again, it is pretty loud in here. If you could please keep it down. Is there any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, uh, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 177. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Senate Bill 177 is adopted. Mr. Shebo, please read the title to House Bill 1276. House Bill 1276 by Representatives Young and Bradfield, also Senators Zinzinger and Lundeen. Concerning the continuation of the Colorado Commission for the Deaf, Hard of Hearing, and Deaf Blind, and a connection therewith, implementing the recommendations contained in the 2023 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Madam Chair, it is an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you. I move House Bill 241276 and the appropriation report. To the committee report. Uh, appropriations um, gave us the money needed, and the majority of these funds, uh, 2.3 million, come from cash funds from a surcharge charge on telephone lines. Uh, is there any further discussion on the Appropriations Committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the, the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The committee report passes. To the bill, Representative Young. I am proud to be here with Representative Bradfield to present the Sunset Process Commission for Deaf, Hard of Hearing, and Deaf Line. Um, I want to give you background about the commission and who they serve and how they serve. In Colorado, it is estimated that roughly 13% of the population are deaf or hard of hearing. 755,569 Coloradans as of the 2021 census. 
About 200 babies are born deaf or hard of hearing each year in Colorado. In 2020, there were 258 individuals in Colorado who self-registered on the National Deafblind Registry. The commission provides needed services for those in the deaf, hard of hearing, and the deaf blind community so they can find the greatest accessibility to society as possible. They provide a wide range of auxiliary services. Auxiliary services include those aids and services that, that assist with communication for a person who is deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. There is also the Early Hearing Direction and Intervention Program, which coordinates with families with children from birth to three, detecting and monitoring hearing loss, and giving them early interventions and appropriate and timely services. I urge and I vote. Representative Bradfield. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Commission for the Deaf, Hard of Hearing, Deaf Blind, provides the services as um, Representative Young has uh, mentioned here. And they um, are continuing to take on more responsibilities as the commission uh, progresses in its, in its life cycle. Um, there are legal auxiliary services helping the people who are deaf, deaf, blind, uh, hard of hearing. Uh, there are rural, uh, facility uh, auxiliary services and uh, there is a, also a, a pilot program that now and when this bill passes will become a permanent fixture with uh, five of the state departments uh, utilizing American Sign Language and other tools for communication to help them communicate with people who are deaf, deaf blind. Um, these services, of course, do not come without a price tag, as Representative Young had mentioned. Uh, however, uh, we encourage that this, uh, this commission continue its work and continue um, working for this community of very important Colorado citizens. I urge an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Chair. I did want to uh, speak to this. Um, I don't usually like sunset kind of bills, uh, usually because they extend it out too far, but this one's actually a very solid bill. I, I have a very strong deaf community in my church, and, uh, and I did not realize that one of the uh, people that are part of our deaf community in our church uh, was part of the petitioning of this to the state and building the budget for the deaf the uh, blind and deaf community, and and uh, this is often a group in the uh, in the whole ADA thing. This is often a group that gets overlooked, and they don't uh, they don't get the the same kind of recognition um, from the state and from the people. And so I want to thank um, both sponsors of this bill. Thank you for being behind this, and uh, and I I hopefully I'm not hurting votes in here, but I strongly urge an e a yes on this bill. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of House Bill 1276. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. House Bill 1276 passes. <coughs> Mr. Schiebel, will you please read the Title IV House Bill 1124? House Bill 1124 by Representative Soper and Mabry, also Senators Will and Gonzalez, concerning discrimination in places of public accommodation. Representative Mabry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1124 and the Judiciary Committee Report. To the Committee Report. You want to talk about it? Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. So in House Judiciary Committee, we made major uh, changes to the bill. So if you're reading the original bill, uh, it's changed quite dramatically. Instead of having a, a hammer approach, instead we changed it to uh, really protecting our nonprofits uh, should they choose to uh, rent or sell to someone who's political or to a political event that it doesn't jeopardize their nonprofit status as long as there's an exchange of money at fair market value and the nonprofit's name or logo is not being associated or somehow construed as an endorsement. So this is just protecting our nonprofits and then we're realigning the fines to the, uh, be the same as the other parts of uh, statute. 
R Representative Babry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, uh, we amended this bill significantly in committee, uh, mostly because my co-prime sponsor and I got this in at the deadline. Um, and uh, so what was published as the original bill was really a rough draft. Um, and what you're seeing here is a lot of the work uh, that probably would have been done if we weren't on such a tight um, deadline. Um, but yeah, as my co-prime said, basically, um, we've clarified um, that this bill is really just about clarifying how nonprofits can operate in the space of leasing um, their space to um, political entities um, and have made it guidance and not a mandate. Um, and with that, we will ask for an I vote on the adoption of the committee report. Is there Representative Bottoms? Thank you, Chair. Um, this is uh, this is again unfamiliar territory for me. Um, I actually think that the bill sponsors did a good job on this. Maybe the lights going out yesterday affected my side too. But uh, to really process, I think this is good. But I did want to I did want to try to amend one thing, and I want to explain this. I move um, 004 and ask it f for it to be displayed. One moment. L004 is properly displayed. Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Chair. So this is my, this is my um, argument here. Uh, of anybody in this room, this is, this is my space, right? This bill is directly affecting my space. Um, and I can explain. What I'm trying to do is take out the word principally. So instead of principally uh, trying to, to limit how, you, how someone might categorize that religious space as principally being for religious purposes, I want to explain a little bit. This doesn't affect me directly because of the way my church is designed, but it will affect a lot of churches. Many of you have meetings in churches. <clears throat> These are political-type meetings. You're just using that space as a space. You're not using it as a church or a religious group or anything like that. And uh, what, what a lot of churches do, some churches only use their facilities for their own needs, and they don't let the public use them. Um, our church, we let the public use our space for free for many, many different things. And many churches do this. And so what happens is, if, if you have the word principally in there, let's say a church has only a Sunday morning service. And most churches nowadays, that's what they do. They have one Sunday morning service. Uh, my church has multiple Sunday services, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Tuesday night, Sunday night services. So we wouldn't apply to this. But what happens is, is if you can prove that the Boy Scouts or the, a, or the AA group or our church has an NA group, uh, if you can prove that all those things are taking up more of the calendar and the time, then somebody could use this bill, which I think is, is a good bill and it does a good job of protecting the nonprofit space and specifically protecting churches, I think it does a good job of that. But if somebody could prove that this, uh, this religious organizational building is being used for more time-wise than church services, then you could, this bill would actually be used against churches uh, to have a political event or something at the church. And so my argument is just take out principally. It still needs to... It, the, the idea Bottoms, is I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment. If everyone in the chamber could please quiet down so we can all hear. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Representative Bottoms. I couldn't tell. I'm kind of loud. But if, if you leave the word principally in there, it, it potentially harms the ability to have, for you and I, to have political type things in church buildings because the word principally actually limits that scope quite a bit. Uh, most churches, guys, and, and you just think about the church you go to, most churches have way more events at their church than church services. Um, again, my church doesn't, but I'm, I'm structured a little differently. And so I would just like to present this, and, um, and hopefully I can talk you into just taking the word principally out, and, uh, and the rest of the bill is actually uh, good um, after, after that word is taken out. And so... Uh, I urge an I vote on 004. Representative Mabry. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and um, thank you for bringing the amendment. We did have this conversation in um, our stakeholding, and I appreciate where you're coming from with it, although I just want to highlight that the word principally is not something that is in this bill. The word principally is something that is in the current law. So it's printed in the bill because we're making a change close to um, where that exists in current law. Um, and so my concern with accepting this amendment and the concern that our stakeholders had with taking out the word principally is that we would be narrowing the scope of Colorado's Anti-Discrimination Act. Um, and that is not the intent of what uh, we're trying to do. Um, and so with that, we'll ask for a no vote on this amendment. Is there any further discussion? Representative Bottoms. I understand everything the representative said, and uh, he's right, it's in law, that's why I would like it stricken, because I want it taken out of law, and I just want to add, pretty please, he did not say pretty please, so pretty please vote yes. Is there any further discussion on Amendment L004? Representative Catlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you. Thank you. Members, this is something that we need to address. In the churches in my community, there are a number of meetings being held. AA, meetings like that that are trying to help the constituents in my community. If this amendment will help that, I really think we should approve it. A lot of good has come out of those churches, not just religious worship services, but services to the quilting clubs, to all of the other places that need a place to meet. They need these spaces. Let's not do anything that might limit that. Please vote yes on this amendment. AML Winter. I also urge an I vote on this amendment. Um, churches in rural Colorado are gathering places. This is the center and hub of most of our communities in rural Colorado, and there are tons of events that are held at these churches. Like the good rep from Montrose said, I mean, we have AA meetings, we have preschools. I mean, they're the hub of rural Colorado. Churches are the hub of rural Colorado. And I think that this is something that the bill sponsor said that is in current law, which it can be stricken from current law. And it may seem like it's not an issue now, but it could be an issue down the road. And I just want to stand and say that this is something that could be used later on. I think it's something that if we've got this open and we're working on it, maybe it wasn't the intent of the legislation, but the bill sponsor himself said that pretty much the bill was a rough draft until we got to the amendment. And I think that this is something that is very worthy of having the discussion about. It's one word. And he said it really don't affect the bill, but if we've got the bill open and we're working on the law, I mean, what would be the issue of striking this one word if it don't affect the spirit of the bill? It was said once again that it was pretty much a rough draft up until this point. So while the bill's open, let's try to take this worry out. We heard from a pastor from El Paso County who does that when he's not here. And I think he has a valid concern. So I urge an I vote on this. Is there any further discussion? Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, I'll just weigh in and say one thing that this is one thing that did come up during our stakeholder work. Uh, we couldn't get agreement here because, you know, all your stakeholders are really big tent and it's uh, sometimes very challenging. I'm, I'm actually for this change, but I also know that I need to be uh, a good legislator. And, you know, when we said that, you know, we were unable to get agreement, we were unable to get agreement. Uh, that being said, I think that we're still open for something in this space because I also know that there is a lawsuit concerning this one word. So if there's something that could be worked out uh, between now and uh, in the Senate, I think that's the appropriate place to be able to do it. But there needs to be a little bit more of a runway because uh, so it's a big change, even though it's one word. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. I couldn't disagree more with my colleague from Delta. This is a House bill. This is the House chamber, ladies and gentlemen. We fix our business in the House for our House bills. We don't punt and defer to the Senate. Let's roll up our sleeves and get to work right now and take care of things. 
why would you allow a piece of legislation to go out of this chamber that may have some kind of judicial scrutiny over one word? Wouldn't the legal beagles in this building and in this room maybe consider that? We can avoid all that with one word. One change, one amendment. But we're not going to do it because we just can't come to an agreement over one word. Well, as a God-fearing Christian, understanding the importance of churches and the religious foundations of this country, in God we trust, I can't think of a better place and a better time to take care of this. I have always argued with my colleagues and said some of the best work is done on second readings with second floor amendments. It's time to get that work done now. It's unfortunate that two bill sponsors can't come together and come to an agreement. I agree there shouldn't be discrimination in any place. But there shouldn't be discrimination in a house of worship either. I will hearken back to COVID when we said churches can't meet and they must close their doors, but the liquor store down the street's going to stay open. <clears throat> Where's the discrimination there, Colorado? Or the pot shop down the street isn't going to close their doors for you folks here in Denver in the metro area, or out in, actually in eastern Colorado as well. We have that situation as well. Or the big box stores have to stay open because people got to get to Walmart, Costco. Representative Holtorf, back to the amendment, please. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. But I digress talking about discrimination in places to the bill title, discrimination in the places of public accommodation. Actually, I'm talking to the bill title, but let's get to the amendment, ma'am. I'm going to look over my shoulder here, if I may. Principally, okay, they're wanting to strike one thing, something so simple, so easy. If I had the bill before me, I think I'd just start reading it right now, and I would actually talk about this amendment, but I don't have it before me. But ladies and gentlemen, it is very frustrating for me as I stand here in this chamber when we talk about an amendment that supports places of worship, and we're getting pushback from these two sponsors, particularly one sponsor, I presume, because my other good colleague from Delta says he agrees with it. So it's the other sponsor that's got the problem. But I, in turn, have a problem. I have a problem with the discrimination against religious institutions and places of worship in Colorado and across this country. I have a big problem with it. That's why I support this amendment. People should be able to worship freely without government intervention, without discrimination, without bias or judgment against their freedom of worship. That's a First Amendment right. So I guess we'll go to court, spend literally hundreds of thousands of dollars on something like this as it gets judicial and legal review. All because we don't want to support or don't want to have the consideration of discrimination in places of public accommodation to include this amendment. Now, nobody in this chamber is more qualified to speak to this than my good colleague from El Paso County, who is a minister who has spoken, who preaches the good word every Sunday to his congregation. God bless him. God bless that legislator who does God's work. And I respect him greatly and his amendment. Now, I could speak to this amendment and my good friend from El Paso County, Representative Bottoms, for hours. In fact, somebody dared me but I will not, Madam Chair. I will step down and step away at this time. Thank you. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I did want to respond to at least a couple of points that were said. First of all, um, nothing is more important in America than freedom of religion and our First Amendment rights. 
Uh, that's why the founders placed it uh, first um, in the uh, Bill of Rights. Secondarily, I do want to point out that the amendment would not even be considered had we not been touching another uh, part of this section of statute. And as part of a bill drafting technique, you include enough words in current law to be able to give context as to what's being changed. So that's what happened here and why the amendment is even able to be run is because we are changing some areas in law and the drafting convention is that you place enough words so that us as legislators and the general public have some context. That's why principally is here. I do want to point out that what is not included under the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act, just so we're all perfectly clear, churches are exempt, synagogues are exempt, mosques are exempt, and then it says other places that are principally used for religious purposes. That is current law. The issue of striking up principally is also the subject of a major uh, litigation that is going on right now. And it's the, um, for other religious purposes. So that might be a church school, or that might be the gymnasium that uh, might be attached to a church uh, that are not a uh, part of the church. This is an area that is uh, very technical. It may just look like one word. I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, I would like to see this change to just, you know, have a just broad exception. But I also know that we also don't necessarily want to grant the exception, for example, to a strip mall where you may have a retail store that just rents to a men's religious coffee club one day a week, and then that business is able to then say that they don't fit under the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act. So that's why it's really important that we choose our words very carefully. This was negotiated at a past time. I think we are open to changing it. It's just this is very um, technical and why it's very challenging for us to accept uh, this amendment. Representative Basenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. I, um, I, I rise in opposition to this amendment as someone who also has completed an MDiv degree and who also was ordained clergy in the church. And I'd like to briefly express to you why. This language is actually something that if we strike it from statute, and it is current statute, it would put Colorado statute out of line with IRS guidance on how churches engage in certain activities. The IRS is fairly clear that you can have conversations and you can provide your space for different activities, including political activities. It cannot constitute the majority of the activity that you do as a congregation. So to strike this language ultimately puts us out of line with IRS guidance, and I would suggest actually jeopardizes the ability of any congregation to engage in this space in a way that is meaningful. I think this language is an important delineation that keeps Colorado statute in line with IRS guidance. And so while I support the ability of congregations to engage in different ways here, mine certainly have. I don't believe that striking this language is actually a good idea, and I think it has an unintended consequence that extends far beyond this amendment. So I would ask for a no vote. Is there any further discussion? Representative Bottoms. Um, just, just for correction purposes, uh, that was all wrong. 501c3 status does not declare this in the state law the way that he said. In fact, the word principally here has always been a point of contention in the 501c3 status legally. That's why it's being sued right now because it's already been noticed as being wrong. And that's why when churches talk about this and they use this, going back to the Johnson Amendment, this, which was struck down, this is wrong in that case. Um, that is the old way of thinking about it, but that's not the legal proper way of thinking about it. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of L004. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those, those opposed, no. L004 is lost. To the bill. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1124? Oh, we're still on the committee report. Is there any further discussion on the committee report? Seeing none, uh, the question before us is the passage of the committee report. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The committee report passes. To the bill. Is there any further discussion on uh, House Bill 1124? 
Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of House Bill 1124. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. House Bill 1124 passes. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title of House Bill 1220. House Bill 1220 by Representative Doherty, also Senator Marchman. Concerning disability benefits for workers' compensation injuries and in connection therewith, allowing a claimant to refuse an offer of modified employment under certain circumstances, adding the loss of an ear to the list of whole person permanent impairment benefits, replacing the two aggregate limits on temporary and permanent injury benefits with one limit adjusted annually by the Director of the Division of Workers' Compensation and requiring a workers' compensation insurer to pay benefits to a claimant by direct deposit upon request by the claimant. Representative Doherty. Thank you. Uh, I move House Bill 1220 in the Business Committee Report. To the committee report. Uh, in committee, we ran uh, two amendments reflecting an agreement between the Workers' Compensation Education Association, Pinnacle, uh, the Colorado Self-Insured Association Ch Chamber, Colorado Competitive Council, and Workers' Compensation Coalition. Um, we consolidated two caps into one while increasing the dollar threshold to 300. The, the introduced version consolidated two caps into one while increasing the dollar threshold to 300,000. But the amendment, this is important, maintains the current two cap system, but increases the dollar amount on both caps. Uh, and then the second amendment we ran dealt with the effective dates for each section. Thank, thank you. Is there any further discussion on the committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Business Affairs and Labor Committee report. Uh, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The committee report is adopted. To the bill. Representative Doherty. Uh, under current law, a claimant's benefit is determined by an impairment rating. Um, a claimant whose impairment rating is 19% or less may receive up to a certain amount from combined temporary disability and permanent partial disability payments. Um, what we did is the bill made several changes related to benefits paid under workers' compensation, including Additionally, uh, in addition to the amendments which raised the caps, uh, allowing a claimant to refuse an offer of modified employment, adding the ear to a list of body parts for which a claimant can receive permanent impairment benefits, and allowing a claimant to have benefits directly deposited into a bank account. Um, and what we have done is we have um, made this bill uh, directly affect the most injured workers in the state of Colorado. Uh, and very proud to have run this bill, and I've worked with all the stakeholders, and I request an I vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1220. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. House Bill 1220 is adopted. Mr. Sheeple, please read the title to Senate Bill 26. Senate Bill 26 by Senators Roberts and Will, also Representatives McLaughlin and Catlin. Concerning requirement that members of certain state regulatory bodies who are appointed by the governor hold meetings to elicit public engagement and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Senate Bill 26 um, on second reading with the committee report, please. To the committee report. Yes, uh, we went through appropriations and um, they agreed to everything that was in there. There was um, $10,000 short little sweet. Thank you. Oh, okay. It's my understanding there's no committee report, so this is to the bill. Yeah, um, Representative Catlin? Okay. I can do the two bill. You can do it? Go. Look. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To the bill. This is a bill that's going to require three agencies to go out into the country and uh, meet with the public, something they haven't been doing for a number of years. So what we've asked them to do is with the passage of this bill, we'll be seeing Hang on a minute. You want this? Uh, no, just a second. I got something here. <laughs> Never mind. We'll be seeing the uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission, the Ag Commission, and uh, until I wasn't ready. The Department of Natural Resources. And, and, uh, well, the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Yeah. This is a good opportunity for us to meet with the people that represent us out there in the country rather than us having to come back to town here in Denver to see them. This is good governance. Representative McLaughlin. It's a good bill. Vote yes. <laughs> Representative, good our bill, Assistant yes. Minority Leader Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of this bill. We talk about this all the time. Um, I think people in Denver need to get out of Denver and need to travel and talk to the people. I agree with my colleague from Montrose. This is good governance. This is what state and state agencies should be doing. I mean, in our communities, it is hard for our constituents to come to the Capitol. 
address their grievances. It's hard for them to come and talk about the things that are affecting their lives. And a lot of times I've been at meetings where the state does come out and they do a whole lot of listening but not a lot of hearing. And I think that this is ultra important. I think people traveling into these districts see how the policies and how they're promulgated affects rural Coloradans, affects the agricultural industry and have real conversations about what we do here and how rule making affects rural heritage, way of life, and how we make our living. So I'm in strong support of this bill. I will say this and scream it from the mountaintops. This is good governance. This is us leaving the fishbowl and doing the right thing. So I urge an I vote. This gives a voice to rural Colorado. Thank you. Representative Altorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I did have a good breakfast this morning and about six cups of coffee. Um, you may have noticed today. I also would like to point out how important this bill is because every department in the state works for the citizens. Department heads, you don't work for the governor. You might get appointed by the governor, but you don't work for the governor. The governor doesn't work for the governor either. The governor works for the people of Colorado. Those department heads work for the people of Colorado. And this type of legislation says, yep, ag, DNR, Division of Natural Resources, Department of Ag, Department of Natural Resources, you will go out and do that engagement. You will listen to the people and you will hear what they have to say and you will work for the people. We the people, by the people, of the people. Not we the governor's office and everybody works for the governor and are going to do what the governor wants or the department head wants because everybody works for the department head. And the department head works for the governor. No, that's not our form of government in our republic. Every one of us here works for the people. The departments work for the people. The governor works for the people. Not special interests, not self-serving elitist interests, not big money, high money, dark money, or whatever you want to call it. It's about the people. So, getting back to this bill, Mr. Chair, we're telling Ag and we're telling DNR to get out there and have these public engagements and listen to your constituents. Listen to the people of Colorado in those 64 counties in every corner of the state. You go out to Craig, you go out to Julesburg, you go down to Walsh and Holly, you go out to Durango and out in that Four Corners area, and you listen to those citizens. You crisscross this state corner to corner, end to end, top to bottom. Because, ladies and gentlemen, many times we don't do it right. But this piece of legislation is, hey, it says, hey, get it right, Ag, get it right, DNR. So I am very proud of the bill sponsors. I am very proud of Representative Catlin. And I'm very proud of Representative McLaughlin. And I'm very proud of our leadership who promotes this type of good legislation in this chamber. Now, not every bill every day do I carry this level of pride. But today, Mr. Chair, I am very proud to see this type of legislation from these leaders that says, Departments, get out there and listen to the people because you work for the people across this state. Thank you to the sponsors for bringing this bill and thank you for their leadership directing these departments so they can do better for Colorado. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 26. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Senate Bill 26 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 161. Senate Bill 161 by Senators Pelton, R. and Marchman, also Representatives Lukens and Soper. Concerning parks and wildlife products and in connection therewith, modifying low-income senior and disabled veterans eligibility requirements for certain licenses, authorizing the Parks and Wildlife Commission to establish by rule a harvest permit surcharge and establishing procedures for, hearing con for hearings conducted by the Commission for denial, suspension, or revocation of a river outfitter license. Representative Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Senate Bill 161. To the bill. 
Rep Representative Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill has several parts to it, all focused on providing greater consistency across CPW products. Uh, through modest technical changes, considerable benefits to parks, wildlife, and people achieving. Uh, this includes greater consistency, increased accessibility, improved opportunities, and infrastructure improvements. Um, I'd like to highlight the senior age for eligibility is just to make all passes and licenses consistent across the board, and that the 25 cent search and rescue fee isn't changing in amount, just changing how that fee is applied to make process consistent. We ask for a yes vote. Representative Soper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill really is a technical cleanup bill uh, for Colorado Parks and Wildlife and also ensures that Coloradans are able to continue to enjoy the outdoors, be able to uh, hunt and fish as well, and keeping fees low. I ask for a yes vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 161. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Senate Bill 161 is adopted. Mr. Shibo, please read the title of the House Bill 1253. House Bill 1253 by Representatives English and Holtorf, also Senator Janal, concerning the continuation of the regulation. Hey, one of second, one second. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move House Bill 1253 to the end of the special orders calendar. Seeing no objection, House Bill 1253 will be moved to the end of the special yes. orders calendar. Mr. Sheeple, please read the title to uh, House Bill 1105. House Bill 1105 by Representative Hernandez, also Senator Gonzalez, concerning the creation of a special license plate to support the Chicano community. Oh, I didn't. No, no, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Representative Hernandez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the bill in the committee report uh, to the committee of the whole with a favorable recommendation. Oh. I move House Bill 1105 in the committee report. I believe there are two committee reports. I move House Bill 1105, the finance report, and the appropriations report. Okay. To the finance report, Representative, Representative Hernandez. To the appropriations committee report. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, I ask for an aye vote. Is there any discussion on the Appropriations Committee report? Seeing none, the motion before us is the uh, adoption of the Appropriations Committee report on House Bill 1105. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The Appropriations Committee report is adopted. To the Finance Committee report. Uh, Representative Hernandez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask for an aye vote. Is there any further discussion on the Finance Committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Finance Committee report on House Bill 1105. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The Finance Committee report is adopted. To the bill. Representative Hernandez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, colleagues, I rise today uh, for the creation of the Chicano Special License Plate. I'm deeply uh, excited about this bill and what it means to my community and Chicanos across the state. Uh, I'm very excited to, to take this opportunity to share with you uh, that this is really deeply meaningful to a lot of folks who come from my community, from my barrio. Um, and uh, I'm asking for an I vote today because uh, the creation of the Chicano Special License Plate not only is an acknowledgement of our heritage in the state of Colorado since its inception and the many iterations that Chicanos have taken on, that we have had a deep part in the creation and execution of the state of Colorado, but the Chicano special license plate also creates a fund for the investment of Chicano youth leadership programs, youth violence prevention programs in my community. So I'm asking today for an I vote because it's an investment in our past and an acknowledgement that my community, that our community has had a deep solidarity and heritage in this, uh, in the creation of the state, and I also ask you to invest uh, in an opportunity for my community to thrive in the future. I ask for an I vote. Uh, members, before we continue the conversation, if folks could please uh, keep down, it's getting a little loud again. Uh, Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I am very proud to speak to this bill and allow me to explain why. 
As a member of the Hispanic community, most of you know that I was born in Spain by now. Most of you know that English was not my first language by now. And if you didn't, you do know now. Most of you know, or don't know, but will know in about a hot minute, that my father lived most of his life in España, Hispaniola. And yes, I am Hispanic. We share a rich heritage and culture through South America, Central America, Latin America, Spain, and other Spanish-speaking countries. We are part of one community, one very large tent. Most of you don't know that I have lived in three Spanish-speaking countries, and I'm not talking about visiting. I'm talking about living. Y hablando español todo el tiempo. Porque eso era el idioma de los países donde yo viví. And what I said is speaking Spanish the whole time because that was the language of those countries. You ask what countries, I know. It's a good question which I will share. Of course, the country of my birth, Spain. Also Mexico. And also Puerto Rico. Before it was actually, I believe, considered part of it was a territory, but it didn't have the same status that he has now, non-voting uh, congressional representation and delegation, representing that island. So I am very much connected with this community, although when you look at me, you say, oh, Holtorf, how so? Well, don't judge a book by its cover, ladies and gentlemen because you might not be reading the first, second, or third chapter that you've overlooked by that book's cover. This is an important piece of legislation. There's something I really respect about the bill sponsor, and that is the respect for our rich language and culture. Chicano, Chicana, hombre, mujer. La diferencia entre ello y ella. Un idioma que tiene miles de años de cultura. Now, for those of you that understood me, I will say it in English because I think it's fair. We have a very rich culture and history that is steeped in our language, identifying Chicanos and Chicanas. It even says in the bill, so thank you for that respect, Chicana y Chicano. Now, this addresses only one specific part of our rich culture. I'm going to give this bill 100% of my support. I wish it would have included a little more, had a little broader scope. For those that can't directly tie to the Chicano y Chicana movement, because of our Hispanic ethnicity and origins. But that subtlety does not take away from the support that I will give this bill. I think it's important that we support this community. Let me tell you a little more history from my colleague, Representative Hernandez, something he also doesn't know, but he needs to know. When I went to Colorado State University, very close to where he went to school at UNC, University of Northern Colorado, both great educational institutions of higher learning, I was the president of the Colorado Student Chapter of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Most people don't know that. In fact, I doubt many of you did. In 1987, I was very proud of everything that we did while we were in and working towards getting people to recognize and appreciate the contributions of Hispanic and Latino and Latina Americans in the sciences, which now we call STEM. 
The one asked that I have, and I'm not going to bring an amendment, I considered it, and I was told, no, it wouldn't be appropriate. It will take away from the corpus of this bill. So I want Representative Hernandez to understand that. This is about the Chicano y la Chicana. El Chicano is a man. La Chicana is a woman who dies directly to this ethnicity and the movement of those immigrants that came to the United States from south of the Rio Grande who became part of the fabric and fiber of what is Colorado and this country. I have an enormous respect for that and those people. I want everybody in this chamber to understand that. They have made vast contributions in so many places. And if you want to know one of the greatest contributions to my esteemed colleagues on both sides of the aisle, it is to agriculture. Los trabajadores y los que ha elaborado en la agricultura. I would argue without them and their contribution you would not be able to go into the grocery store and have all that plentiful produce and all the things that you get in the meat counter, vegetables, fruits, because of their hand. That I recognize and declare today before everybody. Now, there are some problems with the design in this. I'm not going to speak to that. There's other colleagues of mine that will speak to that. But I do want to say, because many of you know, and I'm actually running a license plate bill with a fellow colleague of mine from the San Luis Valley, who's very proud of his heritage and his ethnicity. Because our culture is centuries old. You see, in the 1500s, in the 1500s, my forefathers were in Colorado. In fact, the city of San Luis was the first city in this state that was established because of the history of the world. Now, yes, our history is good, bad, and it's ugly. It's got those beautiful moments. It has the moments that aren't so historically clear and clean, and then we have those times that are blemished, and they're very difficult. I won't speak to that in this bill, but I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm very proud of what this bill says, I do wish that it had a broader scope because I want to be a part of this too. I want to be a part of this, but I feel left out. But I'm going to go stand with my colleagues so I can be part of what we speak of today. And I really thank the folks that actually brought the coffee beans and helped us make the coffee that we drink and their contribution, because six cups of coffee has done me well today. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Representative Armagast. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to speak uh, more to what alarmed me when I saw this bill introduced was the design. Uh, not, not as much the bill language, uh, but the design. Um, the, the things that come to a concern to me on that, that were immediately recognizable, were the words, for one, at the bottom of the, the plate design and the logo in the center of the plate design. So with the words at the bottom, I'll address that first. The problem I have there is um, it's on first impression, offensive. I think it's offensive the same way that it would be for me if I was to put any uh, heritage or ethnicity before the word power. Um, for me, 
Representative Armagast, if we could please keep it to the bill. It is my understanding that there's nothing specific about the design in the legislation. Well, I think we might need some more discussion on that, Mr. Chair, if we might be able to take a recess. The committee will stand at brief recess.
Committee will come to order. Representative Armagas, to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just, I, I want to reiterate, I, as my colleague that spoke before me from the Eastern Plains spoke, the, the bill in and of itself does not say anything about how or what is on the design that was accompanying uh, the bill in committee and otherwise through, uh, through the media, what we saw. Um, all that I'm speaking to is not in the bill title, the bill text itself, but how the design has uh, tied to the bill, which can be concerning if that bill as is, or sorry, if that, that design as is was actually put onto a license plate. That could draw uh, negative attention. So although it's not directly uh, associated with the bill language, the accompanying artwork that was that was published and, and created with the bill is what is of concern. And uh, again, just drawing to that that language at the bottom of the artwork with the word power, and it's as offensive to me if, as if I were to see white power or black power or anything anything of the sort. I think anyone in here can be offended by by that. Um, so that is what concerns me, along with the logo. Uh, the logo in the center of the plate is denoting, a f it's very identical to some other logos that are of political nature with the uh, Democrat Socialists of America. And that's not something I think we need to be putting in artwork on a, on a license plate that's going to be on vehicles throughout the state. So my concerns, li like I said, are to the artwork, not to the language of the bill. This is not anything with the bill sponsor in his language and everything that he's done in uh, stakeholding whatever with the bill. The concern, again, for me, is the artwork associated with the, with the bill, the artwork that was published and accompanying the bill in committee and um, through the different variations of media that it's gone through since. So I just want everyone in here to be cognizant of that. Um, it's, I, I don't think... When we're doing these things, especially with license plates, we see license plate bills come down very often throughout the legislative sessions. Um, we have to be careful how these can be turned into something that goes on vehicles and is, is paraded around our state. Um, there are things that are shut down. We had another license plate bill that was shut down because that design of the Gaston flag was determined to be racist by members of the, of the body. Um, I disagree with that, but that's what we're here to do. We're here to deliberate and we're here to debate those things. Um, this is something that if the artwork went through as it is, to me, would be racist. Uh, anything where you put an ethnicity or a heritage or anything in front of the word power, there's a group that we all know that started that, that made that inherently offensive to most people of any culture in America. Um, so that, uh, with the whole, I mean, let me as well say KKK being the organization that really turned that sour, I think is what we need to avoid recreating. And, uh, with a bill that can generate artwork like that, we just need to be careful before we have anything like that that is on vehicles and uh, for other people visiting our state to see and associate that themselves. So again, not to the bill language or the bill title, but to the artwork that was attributed to the bill. Um, that is where I find offense and I know constituents of mine did the same. So that is what I call the question and ask everyone to uh, make sure that we're, we're aware of that and that we're, when we're doing these things in legislation, especially as it pertains to license plates, that we're careful and cautious as to how the artwork is perceived and or how the artwork is uh, created. So uh, for that reason, I will be a no on this. Thank you. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Six cups of coffee and I'm still feeling really good today. I do want to talk about what my colleague said from Berthet. You see, he and I share a kindred 
brotherly spirit as brothers in arms serving in the military defending the Constitution of the United States against enemies foreign and domestic. And we are very sensitive to those enemies of our country as we have lived, grown, trained, and fought in our nation's wars. I believe, I hope I'm right, that this particular analogy is merely coincidental. The artwork and the graphic is merely coincidental and does not tie to anything that would support communism or socialism or the communist movement or the socialist movement. I don't know. I've seen the graphic and I've also seen some other graphics and I look at the correlation. It may be there, but it may not be. It could be subjective. But I got to believe that there would be no intentionality of trying to support socialism or communism because it's antithetical to what we're doing in this chamber. Representative Holtorp, yes. please, if you could not impugn the motives of any bill sponsors, uh, that would be great. Thank you. No, no, Mr. Chair, I have no intention of impugning Representative Hernandez at all. None. Please also, don't Also, members, it is loud. Could we please, please keep it down? Continue, okay. Representative Holtorp. Thank you. No, I have no intention, none whatsoever, Mr. Chair. I, I truly believe it's just coincidental or a circumstantial subjective analysis. Now, I do want to mention the, the Gaston flag. It's a wonderful flag. It does hang in my office. Representative Holtorf, if we could keep the conversation to this piece of legislation. I understand there was another license plate bill, but we are talking about this um, license, the plate bill. license plate. Thank you. Please, thank I'll you. I'll speak to this license plate bill. And so the point I'm trying to make based on previous legislation um, is that there could be some misinterpretation of graphics and graphical designs and what the intent of that is. That, that was my point, Mr. Chair, that I wanted to highlight and bring up. Because even in that instance, some people misrepresented that and misinterpreted and misunderstood history and the meaning of that. So that could also occur with this. The same type of misunderstanding, misrepresentation, misinterpretation. So we have to be very careful with our subjective analysis of things and how we try to jump to a conclusion. I don't want to do that in this bill, so I'm going to say that based on the previous comments of my good colleague from Berthoud, who I respect as a brother in arms, because he and I both know we swore to defend this country. And communism is something that we stood against because it is not compatible with our Western democratic way of life under a republic, the United States of America. Socialism is not compatible either. Representative Holtorf, please, yes. to the legislation. That is way off base. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I won't speak about socialism and how there's some, there's an inference or a reference to this by my colleague from Berthoud. I believe this is only to uplift and represent that community. That community that's come to the United States of America in many cases to flee, and I'm not going to say the word, Mr. Chair, what my colleague from Berthoud was referencing. I'll just call it the C or the S word. I'm 100% sure in my mind's mind today that this has nothing to do with that, nor should there be any connotation. Because then I couldn't support the bill. And I absolutely do not want that today for this community. So I hope I've explained myself. Um, as we move forward, creating this license plate. And I do understand that those designs are not final. And if there is any reference, inference, or subjectivity in that regard, then it should be uh, brought forth as an objection and the design should be changed. just to eliminate the perception of. Now, here's something I want to do mention. So oftentimes, when I served in many capacities, 
The perception of something is dangerous. We used to say that something is real to those who perceive it even though it's just a perception. So how do you mitigate that so the perception goes away so that it does not become someone's reality in their perception? This is not a game of words. It's actually something real that we need to consider as we move forward with the graphics on the plate. But I will tell you right now, I want to support this community. I want to support the license plate. And I want to uh, say that there should be no reference to anything that's antithetical to our free republic and our Western way of life in a free country. Because communism and socialism is not freedom. Poltorf. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I heard this one in committee, and I was actually a yes vote on this. And I want to explain a few reasons as to why I was okay. Not only did the witnesses that came and testified provide such powerful testimony about their heritage and their pride, I, I, I can get behind that. And just to listen to it, Somebody who doesn't understand that, I get it. I get it. The other reason I voted yes on this one is because there was a promise from the bill sponsor that what was presented was not going to be, or may not be, excuse me, may not be the final product, and that there was a promise to be able to work with anybody who had concerns with what the final product would be. And believe it or not, I actually trust that that is going to be done. I would hope that you would take into consideration multiple times that when we do stuff like this around here, it can be processed as wrong. And, and we have to get that. I am a proud South African American Jew. And I'll tell you first thing right now, I would never come into this piece of legislation trying to run a South African American license plate or a Jewish pride license plate in any way, shape, or form. I just think it's unnecessary. With all the serious issues that we have, I think we need to focus a little bit more. I would hope we all come to the table on this one and give an opinion as to what the final product would be like, honor the heritage of everyone that spoke in committee, and by that point, I think this would be okay. I urge everyone today to get involved in the conversation with the bill sponsors and give input. And do not bring this back to that could be anything destructive, because when we sit and we had a license plate bill that got shut down. We didn't listen to that. We didn't give that a chance. I think it's our duty and our job to listen to each other, be calm on the conversations, and make sure that nothing is going to be a problem in the community when people are seeing this on the back of and front of a car. I will continue to ask the bill sponsor to be accountable for the conversations that are going to be had. And I look forward to the final product, and I appreciate you bringing this. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As a second generation American, I do definitely appreciate the, uh, the cultural, the cultural uh, appeal, the cultural push, identification, but I have some concerns about this bill, starting with, starting with the, uh, the artwork. Now, the artwork has been, has been said, well, there's nothing that says that that's going to be the artwork, but this is artwork that's already been, that's been indicated as something that would be acceptable under the bill. And I find it interesting that the, uh, the community partners that were involved in designing this would either intentionally or unintentionally use what would be typically seen as uh, a very Marxist. Representative, Representative DeGraff, there is nothing in this legislation or the design that has anything to do 
with Marxism, communism, or socialism, those who are bringing it up are impugning the motives of the bill sponsor. That will not be tolerated. You can continue to talk about the design in um, terms of the conversation that was had in committee, but nothing here has anything to do with those things, and that is a p impugning the motives of the bill sponsor. Please continue. I'm not sure where we have any discussion on motive. What I'm saying is that the artwork that was approved and presented as indicative of what we could expect or what we could or what the community partners had in mind has elements so I'm not saying that it's the the intent of the sponsors I'm just saying that it happens to be a fact that the presented artwork has elements that are that are presumably they're certainly not contrary to the bill because because they were presented as part of the bill so there's nothing that there's nothing that impugns the motives it's just that there are there is the artwork that was presented by the bill sponsor in, in, in conjunction with working with the community organizers has Marxist connotations. Now, why? The committee I don't will know. stand in a brief recess.
The committee will come to order. Representative DeGraff, to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I have concerns about the potential artwork. But we're not going to discuss so much the potential artwork. I would like to discuss why I'm actually opposed to this bill, because what this body is supposed to be is supposed to be a deliberative body where we come up and we discuss our concerns, not a rubber stamp of what comes out of committee. Committee should be just, we think this deserves a broader hearing by the body of the whole, by the by our, by our entire, the, the entire house. So here's my concern. And again, as a second generation American, I appreciate the community, the valuing of community heritage. The community pride. But one thing that I'm, I'm very concerned about here is the idea, because one thing that's not here and I don't have a good definition for is what the definition of Chicana, Chicano. We've gone from Hispanic and that has a, that has a definite recognized in the, in the census. It is a recognized, I won't say race, it's a recognized phenotype. But it is based, and it is based largely on the blending of the Spanish and South American indigenous populations. But it's not specific to those areas. I'm guessing that it has to do with Hernan Cortez landing on the Isle of Hispanola and being recruited by the vassal states and eventually overthrowing the, Az the Aztecs who sacrificed 80,000 of their neighbors. And I think that's a tremendous heritage to be proud of. But it is considered, when I look it up, it's considered to be largely language-based, whoever speaks Hispanic. And then Latino, last time we had this conversation, there is no real definition for Latino. I was just told that it's more of a feeling because there are recognized four different Latin languages, Romanian, Italian, French, Spanish. And then you have, and then you have Chicano. So the bill doesn't identify what Chicano is. It just says, it's just very, it's just left as very vague. Now, so looking up the definition, the etymology of Chicano is uncertain. Linguist, folklorist, several theories for the origin of the word. Mexicas, Chicanos, Mexicas became Mexicans, Chicanos gave the term Chicano. The older generation remembers when the words had disparaging implications. Are we thinking about that? I'm great that I'm great that the culture, but what, what I see is now we have, we have lots of license plates. Whether we should have that many license plates, it's water under the bridge, but now what we're doing is we're introducing a race-based. Now, I don't believe in the concept of race. I believe that we're all created equal, endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But what we're doing here is we are going, we are moving away from the e pluribus unum and going to the e unum pluribus and going from one to many. Now that's not, a, that's not an indication that somebody should sacrifice their heritage. I think it'd be a shame if somebody has a Spanish speaking background and doesn't, and doesn't pass that on to their children. But the nature of a strength of this country is not being divided or what we would call balkanized into small groups. So my opposition to this is because now we have opened the door into 
what I think would be euphemistically called race-based license plates. Now, the const our Constitution, all political power is vested and derived from the people, all government rights origin originates from the people, founded on their will, and is for the good of the whole. It's kind of if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. Religious freedom, free exercise and enjoyment of profession, equality of the sexes, the rights shall not... And this does, this bill does recognize the two sexes, heterogametic and homogametic, which is interesting that that's not being opposed. Equality of the rights under the law. So now if we have... Irish heritage, are we going to automatically approve an Irish power, Dutch power, German power? Because what would be the basis of denying those bills? No protected status. We pride ourselves on no protected status. So it it is offensive to me that the sponsor, the sponsors would introduce something that is, as far as I can tell from the definitions, certainly it's unable to tell from the, the wording of the bill, but the definitions that go with the word Chicano, it is race-based. And being race-based, it is inherently racist. And so, in opposition to something that is race-based, I think is, it's ironic, I think it's ironic to be considered racist. If I look, because I was told this didn't have, but if I look at the definition, if I read it in not an unfriendly terms, the Chicano movement denote their rediscovered heritage. That's fantastic. I think that's what we're doing here. Their youthful assertiveness and their militant agenda. So if we're looking at this tag, which is predicated in the recognition of race and a militant agenda, I think we're opening a, I think we're opening a can of worms that is, uh, that is not unifying as a country. I don't think it necessarily has that intent. I can't speak to the motives of the sponsor. I won't try to speak to the motive of the sponsor, although my motives were assigned and disparaged and are untrue. But that is a privilege maintained by others, apparently. So I am opposed to this bill because it is founded in race. The idea of race, which of course I reject, I think it has, has no scientific basis, it causes, it is something that uh, is, is more divisive. And whether it's intentionally divisive or inadvertently divisive, that's where I think we are. And I think it's unfortunate. Representative Hernandez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It sure is an honor to serve with you. It's Mr. Chair, but it's an honor to serve with you as well. Excuse me, my fault, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues, for the, the rigorous debate on what Chicano means. Let me be real clear. Uh, I teach Chicano studies, and so there are entire fields and disciplines that you can go to consult and understand our social and cultural lived experience here in the United States and abroad. Um, I, I want to be very clear. Chicano is not a race. 
Um, and in fact, uh, at, at the risk of, of giving a teacher a microphone, uh, I'm just going to limit this real quick. A Chicano is a cultural uh, identity held by a lot of different people of a lot of different races. And often, while I understand that folks may not understand what a Chicano is, uh, that does not mean that we do not have demonstrable heritage within the state of Colorado. One's lack of historical understanding who may represent people who are Chicanos in their district is not a justification to limit limit my community and our community statewide. Folks, I want us to understand that we put a statewide petition, a minimum 3,000 signatures must be filed with the DMV. There were 3,000 signatures in 48 hours. I don't know what records they have at the DMV, but I do want to be very clear that this is something very clearly that my community responds to that is not exclusive to any race or any one people. Chicano is about understanding our lived experience historically. It means understanding that we were here, many of us, I heard mention of San Luis before the United States was here in places like Alamosa. Thank you, Representative Martinez. Uh, and I also just want to make sure that, that we can be very clear that, that Chicanos have a demonstrable heritage and and that means celebrating simultaneously our lived experience in that heritage. What that means for us in the past deeply informs our present. But Chicano in this context and Chicano in what it has mean in Chicano studies disciplines across the United States, in this place too, in places like the University of Northern Colorado at Metro State University, where folks are doing the work and discipline of Chicano studies, their entire fields dedicated to figuring out what Chicano will mean in the future. And what it means is a cultural investment in our young people. People, so that we do not do so that we do have the equal educational rights and we are not overrepresented in places like our, our Department of Corrections so that we might have the opportunity to attend college and go and, and become a teacher and be the first people in our family to get a degree like I was and this license plate while I understand that some folks may not inherently understand what a Chicano is I do deeply want us to be understand that that is not up for debate in this legislature our community has already proven that we have demonstrable history in the state of Colorado this bill is not just a call to understand and acknowledge that history. It is also a call to invest in the future because the school districts across the state of Colorado are continually make it, made up by Chicano populations. We deserve to have access to our history and investment in our cultural identity. That is what a Chicano is, is somebody who understands where we come from and is willing to water ourselves intentionally so that we may arrive at a different social condition than we have inherited today. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1105. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. House Bill 1105 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1253. House Bill 1253 by Representatives English and Holtorf, also Senator Janal, concerning the continuation of the regulation of respiratory therapy and in connection therewith, implementing the recommendations in the 2023 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it saddens me that my co-prime cannot be here with us today. Let us just take a moment of, of, of quietness just to reflect on her and give her our prayers and her family our best uh, best regards as she struggles with this personal time, please, at your discretion, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, Representative Holtorf requested that we take a moment to reflect on the tough time that Representative English um, is going through. Um, so if we could just take a moment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, esteemed colleagues. As we uh, do this job, that's very difficult. We all know we have families, and, and, and we struggle with the balance between legislating and dealing with those many challenges at home. Um, this particular bill is a bill that comes Representative out. Holtorf, can yes. I ask you to move the bill, please? Yeah, that's a very good idea. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we get started, I'd like to move House Bill 2412-53 with a favorable recommendation. To the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this bill came from DORA. It's a sunset bill. Uh, Representative English and I uh, are on this bill. We both serve in the Health and Human Services Committee. Um, the, uh, the Health and Human Services Committee supports this continuation uh, with respect to uh, the respiratory therapy and those rules that are promulgated to support that. 
Um, I have a uh, very personal reason I wanted to be on this bill. Um, as a combat veteran and one who has spent many times um, and many days and many weeks and months in Afghanistan in our combat outposts and our forward operating bases, many of you heard about the problems with burn pits, um, and that's a real thing for veterans who have served abroad. And uh, because of that, I've actually have issues with uh, respiratory challenges. Um, and I do understand, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to be on this bill, because it is very important that we continue to support um, those that are involved with respiratory therapy and support the DORA regulations. So I ask for a favorable vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1253. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. House Bill 1253 is adopted. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Move the committee rise and report. You've heard the... You have heard the motion. Seeing no objection, the committee will rise and report. The House will come back to order. Mr. Schiebel, please read the report of the Committee of the Whole. Madam Speaker, your Committee of the Whole begs leave to report. It has under consideration the following attached bills, being the second reading thereof and making the following recommendations thereon. House Bills 1105 as amended, 1124 as amended, 1220 as amended, 1253, 1276 as amended, passed on second reading in order and gross in place on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senate Bills 26, 161, 172, and 177 passed on second reading in order revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Representative Mabry. Madam Speaker, I move that the House adopt the report of the committee of the whole. Members, you have heard the motion. There are no amendments at the desk. The question before the House is the adoption of the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Please close the machine. With 42 aye, 18 no, and five excuse, the report of the Committee of the Whole is adopted. <laughs> Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to lay over the balance of the calendar to Thursday, April 11, 2024. Seeing no objection, the balance of the calendar will be laid over until tomorrow, Thursday, April 11, 2024. Any other announcements, introductions? Seeing none, Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move that the House stand in recess until later today. Seeing no objection, the House will stand in recess until later today.